Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Let's jump in. I just want to read it all up front, what we're going to study. So we're, going to, we're going to look at verses 7 through 19, and then I'm going to uh, back up a second and ask, ask you a question, ask you to play a little game with me, I guess. Um, it's a guessing game, a little game show. Name that person. <clears throat> it's been a while since I've done, like, just one thing after the next, you know. So... It's all right. Old days here. We're beginning with the word therefore again. And I'm not doing this on purpose. I'm not stopping every week at the verse that leads us to the word therefore <laughs> next week. But uh, as, you, as, uh, as we've talked about many, many times, you know, when the word therefore shows up in your scriptures, you've got to look ahead of it and see what it's there for. And, uh, and uh, basically, based on everything that's been said, he just continues to say, based on everything that I've taught you about Jesus, who Jesus Christ is, the Son of God that came, who was sent from God to be the propitiation for the sins of all those who would come to believe in Him. Therefore, all right, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years... Therefore, I was provoked, provoked that they, that, that with that generation and, and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest, they be, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort, every, exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin." For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led, uh, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest? but to those who were disobedient. So, we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Now, I want to I describe a person to you, um, a man, and I want to see if you can tell me the name of this man. See if you can guess who this man is that I'm describing. He was born during uh, World War I, and after coming to uh, profess faith in Christ, he became a traveling evangelist, uh, preaching to upwards of 30,000 people at a time and, and on a, on a semi-regular basis. Um, he co-founded the Youth for Christ International, an organization that was created to spread the gospel all over the world, and, and uh, it was a kind of a nation, a worldwide mission, a youth ministry in a way. Um, and over the course of his ministry, he conducted crusades, not only in the United States, but also overseas in Europe, and thousands of people came to Christ because of his evangelistic ministry. He was a, a stadium-packing, gospel-proclaiming Protestant minister. Who is he? Everybody say Billy Graham. If you say Billy Graham, you be wrong, <laughs> at least for this person that I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of a guy named Charles Templeton. You may know who Charles Templeton is? Unfortunately, Charles Templeton. I say unfortunately because this one-time popular evangelist who was a really good friend of Billy Graham, actually, and um, during the 1940s, I mean, that's, that's how long ago this was, he abandoned his post, and he actually declared himself an agnostic. And the seeds of doubt would began to, somewhere along the way, the seeds of doubt began to sow, be sown in, in, his, in his life and in his ministry somewhere along the way while he was attending Princeton, unfortunately. And you know what's odd about that, just a sidebar? I've seen that happen to other people. I had a kid in my youth group who was one of the most dynamic, most dynamic leaders in our youth group. And he went on, got his ministry, got his degree at Johnson Bible College, went on to Emmanuel, then he goes to Princeton. And somewhere along the way in Princeton, he declared himself an agnostic just like Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton later in life, he, he, he uh, had a difficult time, he said, reconciling what he saw 
what he considered to be the goodness of God with the injustice and evil he saw in the world, which is why a lot of people claim to be agnostic. And he fell right into that. In 1996, he wrote an autobiographical work titled, Farewell to God, My Reasons for Rejecting the Christian Faith. And in 2001, he died from complications related to Alzheimer's as an unbeliever. He parted this world an unbeliever, fallen, not having faith, um, through a hard heart. And he had to meet face to face with the holy God with that unbelief. It's a sad story. In our text today in Hebrews chapter 3, and actually in many places in Hebrews, we, we get these warnings about that. I mean, you look at that and you're like, how does that happen? How does that happen? Especially if you believe that, that the author and the perfecter of our faith is Christ and that all of those whom God has put in his hand through Christ will not be snatched out of his hand. How does that, how do you reconcile that in your mind? Well, what we have here is a warning, and and just just as it was intended to be a warning to them, to the Jewish Christians in the original audience, it's a warning to us today. And what we're going to see is what uh, what happens when someone when that when that's taking place. What is happening? How can we define what just happened? And you're going to see an example of unbelief in verses 7 through 11 and 16 and 18. And then you're going to see an exhortation to be careful to not become hardened by sin, like Charles Templeton. The example that we read about here in Hebrews 3 is astonishing, and it should shake us to our core. It should shake us to the bottom of our souls and and make us wake up and say, is this me? I don't want this to be me. And so there's an exhortation here offered in this text that I think we would all do well to, to pay attention to. Last week in our study, as you look back up to some of the verses here, one of the things that we saw is that we were commanded yet again to consider Jesus, right? Consider Jesus, who, as the apostle, not just an apostle, but the apostle sent from God and our high priest of our faith. It says he was greater than Moses because he was not just a servant in the house that God was building, but he was the builder of the house. He built the house. A metaphor that reminds us that while Moses was great and while Moses is to be highly esteemed among the Jewish believers, that he was a servant in God's plan. He was a servant. He was there serving while Jesus is the author and the owner of the plan. And at the very end of that section, uh, verse 6 there, we saw this warning to hold fast to our confidence and boasting in the hope that we have in Jesus. And this holding fast is, is not how a person becomes a believer. Get that. It's not how you become a believer. There's a difference. It's the difference between becoming something and being something. Let me illustrate. I, I want to illustrate this because it'll help us today in our understanding of Many of these verses that we read and, and that, that begin with, the, like, or phrases that we read that begin with if then, like if then or in order that. Did you see that a lot? Did you catch that a lot? In order that, you know, be sure to stand firm in order that. Or if you, you know, if you fall or if, you, you know, if then you do this, then, the, then that. Did you ever try to uh, speak in a British accent? <laughs> Does anybody ever do that? Do you ever catch yourself doing that? Or maybe, or maybe Scottish? You speak in a Scottish accent, you know? You know, nay. <laughs> right? Nay. Or, uh, I, you know, whenever I meet someone with a European accent, I always find myself fascinated by it. Like I'm, I'm watching their lips and I'm listening to them. And then I might be driving in my car later, just, you know, talking to myself in their dialect. You know, that's some more, more Australian than anything, I guess. But, you know, we might be able, we, some of us might be able to come up with a few Australian words, you know, and, and speak in an Australian accent. I know Kaylee used to watch the, what was that group of uh, guys that played the guitar and sang they wore different colored shirts? Wiggles. Yeah, Wiggles. And they were from Australia, right? Down under. And, and, and it's fun. I don't know. It's fun. I don't, and and it, it's amazing to me to find like actors that I watched movies, several of their movies, and they were like, I just assumed they were American and they weren't. They were, they were, they were British actors with British accents and they were mimicking our language and Australian accents that were, but they were mim- mim- they were basically mimicking us like we mimic them. And, uh, and we could do that, right? You could, I could, I could meet someone from Australia and I could try to talk like them and, and they'd be like, nice try, mate, you know? And, uh, and, and, but, and the reason why is some people speak with that accent because that's who they are. That's their dialect. And all we can do is try to emulate it. And that's why you laugh, because it's funny. 
because you know that's not really who I am. I'm just sounding like somebody. I'm just saying the words and I'm just sounding like it, but that's, that's not who I am. Now that's how we should understand or try to understand this text and these couple of exhortations in the Hebrews text. There are a couple of verses here. The first one is in ver- is verse six that we ended with last week in chapter three. And if we are his house, we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And then also we have a verse here in today's text, verse 14, if you look down at it, and it says, for we have come to share in Christ if only we hold to our original confidence, firm to the end. Now those statements are not conditions upon becoming a Christian. They're not conditions, they're not, they're not conditions that, are, that show you that, that you were a Christian, but if you didn't do this, then you've, you once were, but you fell away. They're not, they're not conditions on becoming a Christian, but they're, they're examples of being a Christian. That's what this author is showing us. If, if these things, holding fast to our confidence or boasting in the hope that we have, if they do not happen in a person's life, it does not mean that they stopped being a true believer in Christ. It means that we were never believers to begin with. If it ever stops, I mean, true, genuine faith will never, never fall away. True faith will always work itself out. And the reason why I say that confidently is because it's not you that has to work it out. It's not you that's the author of it. It's God working in it to create it and to sustain it. That's what, that's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. Let's, let's, let's turn there, actually. In Philippians 2, um, and I'm going to need to find the verse because I didn't write this down in my notes. I think it's starting with verse 12 because it's after that long dissertation about um, Christ leaving heaven. Yeah, verses 12 and 13. Listen to what Paul says. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This sounds like something you do, right? We're, you're working out your own salvation. So you, there are things that you have to do. But what's it say next? For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You know, I can fake an accent, but I can't fake birth. And that's what being a Christian is. You have been born again. And let me ask you, Think back to your birth. (laughs) Can you remember that far? What did you do? How how did you make yourself born? Why does Jesus call it you've been born again? Because that's what it is spiritually. You've been born of God. God birthed you into this new covenant relationship with Jesus. Now back in the wilderness, this, this author of Hebrews he, ta- he goes back and, and provides examples, a lot of examples from the Exodus and from, from the Israelites. And back in the wilderness in, in Israel, or Israel in the wilderness as they were coming out of Egypt, they spoke with an accent. The people of Israel spoke with an accent. And many of them spoke with that accent because they were true, genuine believers. I mean, men like Joshua, we've read about Joshua and Moses and Caleb. They had truly encountered God and they relied heavily on God. And they were truly, you could see to, to the end, they were truly believers in God. And, and many, but, but many of the people in among that group of Israelites tried to talk the talk. They tried to, to speak the way, you know, figuratively speaking, the way that Moses and those did that, that truly were believers, but they just couldn't do it. They couldn't walk the walk. And so what the author of Hebrews tells us is he, he uses Psalm 95 to quote, um, to make a quote and a citation about what happened and to point about the dangers of what? The dangers of the whole thing. The whole point of today's scripture is this. It's about unbelief. It's about, un- it goes back to just a pure unbelief. Charles Templeton did not believe. And it's amazing that somebody who doesn't believe could actually read the verses and tell someone about this Christ that saves and yet himself not even believe it. Listen, that's a scary thing to me as one who stands up here every week and tells you. And so I go down and get on my knees and I say, God, I make sure, I, I believe, I believe in you. I believe that you are the author of my faith. 
I mean, let's, let's reread these, these verses here so we can get them in our heads again. Verses 7 through 11, just not all of them, but 7 through 11 in, back in Hebrews 3. This is that quotation of Psalm 95. Okay, now it says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they have not known my way. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, whenever we read a quotation from an Old Testament passage, whenever you see that in the New Testament, I mean, that, what you're seeing is an author in the New Testament citing an old writing hundreds of years before, an old scripture that many of them, all of them, most of these people reading this probably would have recognized from the, old, from, from the Psalms. You have to ask yourself why. Why is he doing that? Why, why is he quoting this? What does it have to say to them in that day? And then, of course, as this has been passed down to us by the Spirit of God, what's it have to say to us today? Why is that quote in there for us? Well, here in Hebrews 3, the author is providing an example of unbelief to warn these Jewish Christians against abandoning faith in Jesus. Don't, don't, don't turn away from what you're hearing, is what he's saying. And it's a hard heart and rebellious attitude of the Israelites back in the, the days of Moses. That was the reason that thousands of them died off in the wilderness. That's what it says. The reason they died off was because of their unbelief. Now catch this. They did not enter the promised land because of unbelief. Now that's astonishing. How could they not believe? I mean, think about what they saw. Think about what they went through. I mean, look what it says about them in verse 9. Where, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. 40 years. Could you imagine seeing the plagues in Egypt? I'm tired of these locusts already, and that's just one plague, and it's not even close to what it was like for them. I mean, they were, they were falling everywhere on them. I had one fall on my neck the other day. It freaked me out. It started screaming on my neck out, outside, and I'm like, I, there's something about them. I don't know. But there were eight others. I mean, they, they had all kinds of plagues, and they saw that. They saw what God had done. They saw how God led them out of, of, of Egypt, out and through the wilderness. They saw how God, they came to the Red Sea, and there's nothing they could do about crossing that sea. But God told Moses to stand there, raise his staff, and that sea parted. They walked through that. God saved them and then closed the sea on the army behind them. They saw that. They saw dozens of other miracles. They saw, they saw food come from heaven, manna come from it, just drop out of heaven. And it wasn't airplanes dropping them over Africa. It was food, God providing food to, 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 to them in the wilderness. God providing water from a rock. I mean, they saw this kind of stuff. And it says that for 40 years, they saw that kind of stuff. And yet they still did not believe. They still did not believe. And we wouldn't believe either. You wouldn't. You wouldn't believe apart from a miracle taking place in your heart. If you believe today, thank God, praise him for the miracle that he did in you. Amen. Jesus said this. This is, this is not just me saying this. Jesus taught us this. You've been taught this by Jesus here in this church. In the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. Flip back to John chapter 10. Jesus engages in a conversation with some Jews who wouldn't believe in him. They just wouldn't believe. And the interaction between Jesus and these unbelieving Jews is pretty interesting. We're going to read verses 22 through 30. At the time of the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, at that time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you don't believe because you're not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, 
is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now notice the interaction between Jesus and these unbelieving Jews here. Notice the progression of how their conversation took place. They ask him, hey, tell us plainly. And Jesus replies, I have told you plainly. I, you, do you ever, you ever wonder why that happens? Why someone would, I mean, did you ever maybe go to church, hear a sermon that most likely was the gospel being told very plainly? Back before you were a Christian, you went back home, didn't affect you at all, did it? But now you hear it, you're a Christian, now you hear it, the same message, you're like, this has an incredible effect in my heart. You hear it, and you didn't hear it before. Same message, same gospel, hasn't changed. Preaching hasn't changed. The, the, the word hasn't changed. Those who preach the gospel, preach the Bible, just literally preach the Bible. It hasn't changed. It, 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 for hundreds of years, the message has been the same. One day you didn't hear it, one day you did. Are you smarter because, I mean, what, 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 what caused that? Well, Jesus tells us what caused it, right? I mean, he even tells them that, you know what, this word that I'm giving you plainly, it's falling on deaf, deaf ears. I mean, you, you, you can't hear. And notice that Jesus even tells them the same thing that we see in this Hebrews text, that he was even doing works. He was doing works of miracles. You saw miracles, he says, and you still don't believe. And the reason they didn't believe in Jesus is revealed right here. Jesus says, you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Isn't it fascinating that he doesn't say it the other way? He doesn't say, you're not part of my flock because you don't believe. That's, that would change that sentence tremendously, wouldn't it? That would completely change the meaning of that sentence. But Jesus, Jesus intentionally says, you, you are not part, you do not believe, you do not believe because you're not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is absolutely astounding. And I want you to ponder this because it will make all the difference in the world of your assurance that you are saved, that you are in Christ. It will assure you more than anything that you are in Christ. I mean, listen, if you're listening to this right now and you go, yeah, I get that, then you've heard his voice. The shepherd has spoken and you hear him and with your little spiritual ears, you've picked him up and you're there, you're ready to follow. But if you're not getting this, like if you're just not, if it's just not something that you, that's clicking, you're just like, I, I, it just sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher to me, wah, 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 then pray, 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 and pray like you've never prayed before. Pray that God would open up your deaf ears and enlighten your blind eyes that you would see. Listen, the reason these Jews did not believe had not to do with their lack of faith, but it had to, everything to do with whom they belonged, to whom they belonged. They did not belong to God. They had heard Jesus' teaching. They had seen Jesus' miracles. And yet, for some reason, they didn't believe. And Jesus tells them why they didn't believe. You don't believe because you do not belong to me. Hard hearts can't believe. They just can't. They need to be woken up. They need to be made soft, beating with a, with, with a heart that beats to hear Christ. Faith isn't something that you just naturally have. You're naturally a doubter. You're naturally a blasphemer. We're, we, we, we don't believe. We don't, we don't have, we're idolaters. We're God-haters by, by nature. That's not, faith isn't something that you just have. You don't just have, you don't, you don't select faith. Faith is first and foremost a gift from God. And this is why Israel fell away in the wilderness. If you go come back now to Hebrews chapter 3 and the illustration that's being used here of Israel in the wilderness, this is the whole reason why they, it says they fell away in the wilderness. Because, Hebrews 3.10, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. They have not known. Now, how could he mean they have not known my ways? How could he mean, I mean, how could he literally mean they haven't known my ways when he had given them, God had given them the law through Moses. He had given them Moses to, to, to speak to them, to show them the law, to show them God's laws and God's ways. And yet he says, the reason they've gone astray is because they have never known my ways. And here's why. It's because a proclamation of something is not 
in and of itself effective to produce what it commands. This is why I could preach to a whole group of people until I am blue in the face. And I could try to come up with all kinds of clever ways to give the gospel of Jesus Christ to you in a different way. But just the proclamation of the gospel in and of itself is not effective to produce what it's commanding you to do. I say follow Jesus. I tell you, fall, command you, follow Jesus. He is the only way to God. He is the only, he's the way, the truth, the life. If you're looking for forgiveness of sins, if you know you're guilty, if you know that you have no way of making, of, of being uh, found in favor with God or righteous in God's eyes, if you believe in God and you know that that's true about you, then Jesus is the only way that you could ever be found in God's eyes, righteous, justified, perfect in his sight. And I could say that again and again and again and again and again. And just the saying of it will not change you. That's not what changes you. Your decision to come to someone and say, I believe that, and then your follow-up baptism in water, that does not change you. Something else changes you. Now listen, this should give us great joy to know this, to know that it is God that works to save you. I mean, the mere proclamation of telling someone the gospel, preaching the gospel, is not sufficient for conversion. Now, this might seem counterintuitive, but if we believe Jesus' words in John 10, 26, what we just read, that the reason the Jews did not believe was because they were not part of his sheep, then we have to ask our question, ourselves this question, how then does anyone believe? How, how do you, if, if you can't, if, you're, if, you, if you fall away because you can't, how, how does anyone believe? And the answer, according to the scripture, is conversion is an act of God. And it's an act of God that is even greater than raising someone from the dead. I mean, in fact, that kind of word is used in the Bible for what your conversion was. Listen to these words now. Listen, Paul uses these words in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and then I'm going to read 4 and 5. He says, and you were dead. He actually says that. Now, he's speaking spiritually, right? Because he's talking to people who have eyes and ears and they're breathing, their heart's beating, and their brain is working, and so it's obvious they're not dead. The people that are reading this and you listening to this today, you're not dead physically. But Paul tells them you were dead. So he's talking about your spiritual life. Your spiritual life was dead. You were dead in the trespasses and, sin, and sins in which you once walked. Verse four, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead, even when you were dead in your trespasses, what did he do? What did he do? Did he throw you? I mean, if you were dead and you're floating out in the ocean, just imagine yourself floating out in the ocean dead. I know it's a morbid thought, right? But let's say God, let's say God sees that you're dead, right? According to Paul here, he's saying you were dead in your trespasses and sins, and you're floating in the ocean. So Paul says, then God threw you a life raft. He threw you one of those life rings, right? Somebody says, why are you a Christian today? And you say, because I chose Jesus, because I became a Christian, because I professed something, I, I prayed a prayer because I was baptized, if that's your answer, because I did this. That means that you, your dead body floating there, reached out and grabbed that life ring. Now, let me ask you this. How on earth do you grab something when you're dead? What God does is he takes your lifeless, dead body your lungs are not working, your heart is not beating, your brain is dead, you're at the bottom of the ocean. And God says, God says, Paul says that God, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead, even when you were on the bottom of the ocean floor, he did something. And the word that it says after that is he made us alive together with Christ. And by grace you have been saved. We could throw all the life rings we want to a dead body, and that dead body is not going to grab a life ring. You know what that dead body needs more than anything? That dead body needs someone to reach down and grab them and breathe new life, pump blood into their veins again, breathe new life into their lungs so that they can come to life 
That is why it says you have been reborn. You have been reborn. You're a new creation. You have been, you were once dead, but now you are alive. Listen, the Bible is so very clear about how this happens, and it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with your great God. God grants life, and all of that is grace. It's, a, it's, it's all grace working through faith. I mean, if God did not make dead people alive, if they did not make you live, then you would never believe. You would never have made that choice to say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You never would have gotten in that baptistry if God hadn't made your heart beat for him once again. If he hadn't brought you to life, that's who did it. This life-giving power, God gives, he brings, he brings with it faith for you to then say, I'm gonna call upon the Lord to save me. Something that he has already done. <laughs> Something that he has already worked and begun working in your heart. The Holy Spirit births Christians and as a result, they believe in Christ. That's the way it works, guys. John says this very thing. I mean, John speaks it exactly like this. Have you ever read 1 John 5, 1? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, has been born of God. And notice that it says, has been, not will be. Notice, you gotta notice the the the. the the order, the chronological order that these things are, are spoken of, right? Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ doesn't say will be born again, will be born of God. It says has been born of God. That God did something. He initiated in you that belief and you responded. Praise God that you heard and you responded. Praise God that he did that in you. And so Israel, going back to this and, and going back to what it says here at the end of verse 11, Israel, at least the unbelieving portion, it says, failed to enter the land and could not enter into what it says as, as God's rest. And, and, and I think it's valuable to provide, a, a, I guess, a, a brief definition of what this word rest here in, is, in Hebrews is because it's a, I think there's a reason why the Hebrew author quoted Psalm 95 instead of directly from Exodus because basically Psalm 95 is talking about what happened in Exodus and we have an account of it in Exodus what took place but Psalm 95 actually uses this word that they shall not enter my rest and so we need to think about that why did the Hebrew writer use this phrase that they shall not enter my rest and and there I, it's, it's worth it to say that there are good the, re, well respected theologians across the Christian world that have interpreted that word just differently and how it's used for example Ray Stedman defines it like this he says God's rest in Hebrews 3 is coming to Jesus coming to Jesus by faith and entering his salvation rest where self-effort is to be replaced where all your life you've just been doing things on your own you know, and, and self-effort is replaced, and it's replaced by the spirit-initiated and empowered effort. And so Stedman is speaking of those who actually have entered the salvation rest by faith. And he explains that many believers experience breakdowns in their Christianity, that even true believers will, will come to places where you're just empty, right? And it's not a loss of salvation, but it's a loss of joy. And it's a loss of, it's a sense of, of just powerlessness, you know, in your life, and it's a sense of that you've lost the presence of, of Christ. You ever feel like that? Does that ever, does that ever happen to you? You know, maybe under the pressure of, of all the stresses in this life and all the responsibilities that you've taken on, that, that maybe what's happened is you've come to a place where you're just trying to work out your salvation in your own power, and you've not learned to operate out of rest, entering, just, just recognizing God did this. I feel so terrible for people who think that they did it themselves. I mean, how stressful is that? How stressful is that that you have to keep, you just have to keep earning God's favor over and over again? I mean, if you did it to start with, you're going to have to keep doing it. A literal translation of this word rest, and I think this might be closer to what it's actually being, the way it's actually being used here, is it's used as a noun, the feminine form of a noun. And it literally means the heavenly blessedness in which God dwells and of which he has promised to make pers persevering believers in Christ partakers after the trials of life on earth have ended. So it's both something that you enter now and later. 
now through faith in Christ and later for all eternity. And so we, we catch a glimpse of this, right? We catch a glimpse of the, the, the extent of the meaning here as, as you read further. If you're, as you read verses 12 through 15, there's, there's even more. I think it, it expounds on a little bit more. Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion. And, and so, you know, the author here in verse 12, he, he warns us against this falling away from the living God. And then in verse 14, he says that they, that, that they have come to share in Christ. And so I, th I think that it is, when you look at those two things, I don't think it's a stretch to say that being with the living God is the same thing as sharing in Christ. I mean, in fact, there is no fellowship with God apart from union and faith in Christ and Jesus. And so rest is, at least in some sense, in one sense, maybe like what Ray Studden was saying, that you've come to rest in Christ, but you, but you, you, sit, you sometimes fall away, you fall back because you try to do it on your own. And so it is, in some sense, a now thing. But I don't think the author's intention here in this whole section of Scripture, based on the context of everything that he's been saying in Hebrews, the Hebrew author now, I don't think it's necessarily to discuss union with Christ in and of itself and what that means, at least not completely, not his primary intent. Instead, what the author is doing in this section of Scripture is he's giving a warning. He's saying, I mean, verse 12, take care lest there be in any of you an unbelieving heart. I mean, the main part of all of this, the, the, the main cog in the, in the, uh, that causes all this to bog down is an unbelieving heart. And so what we're cautioned to be on alert of is the evil and unbelief that's in our own hearts. And not only in our own hearts, but we're also told here to be aware of it in others as well. Verse 13, but exhort one another that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. This is, a, this is an important point, and we'll just kind of maybe close on this. Have any of you, have you ever found yourself just, I mean, think, think to a time. Have you ever found yourself just becoming hardened by the deceitfulness of sin? Think about how this works. I mean, just for a minute. Is there something, is there something maybe in your life right now that you perhaps participate in regularly that maybe five, seven, ten years ago you would have considered to be sin? And maybe it's not sin. Maybe it's, maybe, you know, maybe it's not. But maybe there's something that because you just continued, just regularly, regularly, you just maybe don't even recognize it as sin anymore. And, and, and so when that happens, when that sin is committed, you, you're not conscious to recognize it and confess and say, God, I just sinned. It becomes easier to do, doesn't it? It's deceitful. And so what happens is we become hardened. The scripture tells us here that we become hardened because we're no longer affected by it with feelings of guilt or shame. And therefore we no longer confess it. And therefore we're no longer repentant. And so what has happened is we become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin deceives. I mean, it tries to convince you, hey, this isn't really sin. That's what it does. This isn't really, I mean, it, it maybe once felt like sin, but after a while, if it's become part of who you are, it's become easier and easier. And the reason it's become easier and easier is because you've become deceived. And you're now participating in something that you would have never done. You would have never thought about. How did that ever happen? I mean, stop yourself today and think, if that's happened with you, stop yourself and say, God, help me to stop this. How did that ever, it happened because we became deceived, thinking, all right. But I think even this truth is still not the main focus of this passage. I mean, as horrible as that is, and as important as that is, I mean, if, I mean that's something that we really have to take into account. But it, it, if there's one thing that this passage is screaming, it's this issue of unbelief. And this issue of, I love this, I love this, that your faith and your, as we call it, sanctification, as the scripture calls it, your becoming more like Jesus happens in community. 
It happens in a community that is watchful and aware of the dangerous effects of sin. I mean, sin is terrible. It's, it, it destroys, it severs relationships, it, dis, it devastates homes, it kills people, it rips families apart, it stirs up the wrath of God. And we must, we must, as, as John Owen once said, be killing sin or it will be killing us. We have to make war on it relentlessly every day. And that means we must hold one another accountable. Exhort one another every day, it says. Exhort one another every day. I'm thankful for men and women in this church who have seen sin in me and confronted me. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm a sinner. <laughs> I, I mean, if you, I live, I, and, and I live such a public life in so many different facets of it that I'm going to sin, and you're going to see it. You're going to know about it. You're gonna, I mean, if, you, if, you were, if you're disappointed in that, you're like, I'm going to another church because I thought pastors are supposed to be perfect, well... I'm sorry to disappoint you. I mean, it, but I'm so thankful f- for the love and the accountability that exists in the family of God, in this family, in the greater family of God, because we all need this. Exhort one another daily. And in the appeal of Psalm 95, Psalm 95, which is the main thrust of this passage, and the appeal of Hebrews 3 are all toward fighting unbelief. Do not harden your hearts, they cry, right? And when we see the deceitfulness of sin hardening a heart, it's our duty, it's our calling as Christians to come alongside that brother and that sister and to fight it, fight that sin with them. And that's the, that's the, the beauty of being part of this community of Christ. This passage ends with one thing, and I want to f- close with that. And you guys, up, up, you guys make it back up here. You're making me nervous. Make, I think I'm going to fly solo 100%. Verses 16 through 18, and then verse 19 is sort of an application. For, those who, uh, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? Or was it those who were disobedient? So we see, and this is the application. After all of that, right? After all that he said, don't fall, don't fall, don't, you know, it, 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 you know who was it that fell? Who was it that didn't, you know, that, that, that you know, died because of their sin? And then after all that, he says, so we see, that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. There was never belief there to begin with. I love how the, the Hebrew writer just wraps it all up here at the end of this chapter and says they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So who rebelled? Who provoked God for 40 years? I mean, the same 40 years that he did great miracles in their presence, the same 40 years that, that he would led them out of the, of the wilderness. Who couldn't enter God's rest? And the answer is, it's all of those who had unbelief in their hearts. That's who it was. It wasn't the the Christian who truly believed but struggled from time to time and the others came alongside and held them accountable and helped them fight sin. It was those who just never had belief in their heart. They failed to enter God's rest because of unbelief. Now, let's bring that to you and me. What about your heart? Are there areas, areas in your heart that are just being covered up or that are covering sin, sin of unbelief? Do you, do you find yourself doubting God's provision for you through the work of Christ? Do you feel like, like, like you know, it is only by your work and by your own ability that you're able to meet God's standards? Do you doubt his love for you when maybe you're in the darkest storms of life and, and, and the, the things that life brings, the trials that it brings? Listen, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. If you're hearing his voice and you're being convicted by this word today, if you love this word today, then rest assured, you belong to his fold. It's an awesome thing. And if you don't hear his voice, you can repent. You, 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 can, you can pray, God, I want to believe. I want to see you. I want to hear you. Believe the gospel. Believe the good news that Jesus has come into the world and he has created, this world that he has created and he has come as the son of God to provide you rest, that you might enter into that rest. And you can't enter into that rest apart from recognizing your sin, turning from it and believing in Jesus Christ. That's the bottom line. 
That's the reason why hearts are hardened. That's the reason why people fall and, and die outside of Christ. It's all because of unbelief. It's not because they, they were a Christian and they sinned and then they fell after they, they died after they sinned. It's just because of unbelief. That's it. That's the, that's the, that's the equalizer right there. Believe, unbelief. In Christ, not in Christ. Let's pray. Father, um, my prayer this morning is that you would increase our faith, that we would hear this word this morning and we would know that it's your desire that we would hear and believe that you want every person in this room to, to, to fall in love with this message that Jesus Christ has come into the world to be the propitiation for sin, to be what we couldn't be, to do what we couldn't do ourselves. And your love for us extends so far. And so God, I pray that those who are here this morning that are hearing this and they do believe and they're excited about this word, I pray that they would, just as we sang earlier, that they would just throw their life upon all that you are because they know because we know that you came to save us. And you gave yourself for us. What an awesome thing to know. And those who know that here this morning, may they rejoice that they know that. May they have joy that they know that, that they've heard that. And may they rejoice in the fact that they don't have to hold on to their salvation. They just have to work it out. You're the one that's holding on to it. They just have to keep becoming more like Jesus. They have to keep striving and walking forward and getting, getting uh, more, more involved in, in, in those things that bring an increase of faith in you. But you're the one that's holding on to us. You're the one that has us in your hand. It's not the other way around. I'm thankful to be part of your fold. And I'm thankful for all the brothers and sisters here who are and all those who have not yet come but are and they're hearing, and you're working in their heart, Lord. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.